We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Welcome back to the next episode of the Energy Impact Podcast. Uh, we're joined today by Alicia Seiger, who's the Managing Director of Stanford Sustainable Finance Initiative. She's a lecturer at the law school. I don't know, there's probably three other titles that I could have used, but we'll, we'll get into that. Alicia, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Um, okay, well, before we get into all of those cool titles and cool work, uh, tell us about yourself. Where, where are you from? I was actually born at Stanford Hospital. Uh, grew up in uh, Menlo Park in Los Altos Hills. Uh, so Silicon Valley native and lived the bulk of my life here in this uh, in this uh, collection of zip codes. Yeah, kept it kept it close to home. Yeah, well, I did. Yeah, go... what, was, uh, what was life growing up then? Like, was was were you always preordained to be at Stanford in some form or fashion? Or how did that, how did that <laughs> well, uh, the birth story is compelling. Um, I mean, I was always compelled. You know, universities are fun places to to be around. So you know, I went to sports camp and stuff growing up, but. Um, and, and I went to middle school and, um, well, elementary school, middle school and high school with the children of Stanford faculty, but my family had no affiliation to Stanford growing up. So, um, it wasn't, wasn't preordained, but I certainly had that the site set at some point and, uh, missed it for undergrad, but had the, the gift of going there for graduate school. So that was a pleasure. I did leave the state of California for my undergraduate degree. So I, I spent some time in North Carolina, um, and then, uh, at Duke though, not for, for any UNC fans that got excited there. Uh, don't get too excited. My sister uh, was and, a Tar Heel, so I won't. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> but what, okay, yeah, so so you grew up you grew up on the West Coast, and you're like, I want to go somewhere different, or, you know, how did Duke come about? Um, so, well, interesting story, and as I have friends now who have kids who are going through the college admissions process, which is a brutal thing, you know, I had been a, a good student. I was a student athlete. I you know, lots of extracurriculars thought I might have had my, my choice of, of an undergraduate institution and got kind of hammered in the undergraduate <laughs> admissions process. Checked a box on a common application for Duke um, because I was looking for more schools where I could play soccer, which actually was division three, but I was going to fill out the form for just one or two schools. So I thought I'd just check the box <clears throat> for Duke might as well. And as it turned out, as I, as, as the admissions um, letters, you know, came in, um, Duke became a, a top choice. And, and I remember touring it. I went up to visit Middlebury in um, middle of April and it was snowing. And I was like, what is that about? And came down to Duke and people were playing Frisbee on the quad and it was about 70 degrees. And I said, this, this will work. Yeah. <laughs> so felt like Stanford, but 3000 miles away. <laughs> Well, amazing. Okay. So you played, did you end up playing soccer at Duke as well? I yeah. played club soccer at Duke. Duke, when I was there, was number two in the nation and, and uh, was, was a little beyond my my capacity. Yeah. You're spending time in the classroom. Yeah, right. And, and so, like yeah. So what did you study and, and why? So that was interesting. I actually, I thought I was maybe going to be pre-med. Um, I was interested in, in, I guess in medicine at that time, but it felt strange to decide your future when you're 18 by going into a pre-med um, track. So kept my mind open to possibilities. And um, my freshman year, I took a, a seminar where the uh, required reading was Al Gore's Earth in the Balance. And I just became transfixed with this question of how to maintain biological, the, the stability of biological and human systems. And that just hooked me. And I think there was a little part of me too, trying to find my identity in college, you know, as the Californian, I was supposed to be more about nature and the environment. And so that sort of started to shape my identity in some sense. And then as I was trying to figure out my ma major, I discovered this uh, program that Duke has called Program Two, where you can design your own curriculum. So the entrepreneur in me 
stepped out and built my academic experience. So I combined environmental science and policy and cultural anthropology into a environmental policy and anthropology major. I'm the one and only person <laughs> who has that degree from Duke um, and combine that with a study abroad to Australia, um, studying uh, Aboriginal studies and reef ecology and sort of combining that kind of human and natural systems questions and wrote my senior thesis on the opportunity for intellectual property rights to play a role in cultural in preserving cultural and biological diversity, mm. which really was kind of a through line for my career in some ways, but but hard to translate that into a career coming out of college. So there were some stepping stones uh, between there and here. Fascinating. Yeah. Did you find that, um, that, that, that reading and like you sort of gravitated to this subject gave you um, sort of more guidance or direction than your fellow classmates? I mean, it, it sounds like so specialized yet so broad at the same time. Right. But yeah. it's not that different than choosing pre-med as an 18 year old. right? <laughs> Well, I, I, I would argue it was, I mean, it, it certainly in the sense that like, you know, you're pre-med at 18, you know, you're going to be a doctor and you know, you've got decades of study ahead of you in a, in a, you know, you've made that decision at that age. I think that the course that I set out in college was one that was very expansive and um, unknown and very unclear how to translate that into a career. And that I really found when I graduated and I came back, you know, here I'd been living in Durham, came back to, uh, to my family in Los Altos Hills and looking around thinking what, you know, I can, I can work for a nonprofit or an NGO and get it, which wasn't satisfying to me at the time. Um, and I also felt like I would be sort of getting coffee for people rather than doing the real work that, that compelled me. And so at that time, this was 1996, the internet was, um, you know, existed, but it was <laughs> nothing what it is today. And this thing called web advertising was something no one had ever heard of and had no idea why you would ever want to do that. And I found this very early stage startup where I was the ninth employee and built what was the beginning, you know, the foundation of, of what is, you know, pervasive now in terms of auction-based, uh, real-time, uh, real-time auction-based uh, web advertising platforms. And that, you know, so that really sparked my, um, interest in entrepreneurship and my sense of um, place in um, on the frontier of markets and in early stage ventures where you've got a meritocracy where your creativity and effort and curiosity propels you to you know with without limit um, and that was a sweet spot that I knew I wanted to stay in and and was that kind of a happy accident then or is that was there a tie <laughs> somehow to the you know a very cool business, right? And very cool evolution yeah. of a market, but but seemingly unrelated to IP and biodiversity. Totally unrelated. And and it was, you know, there was, I, I actually spent the summer working in a bike shop on Nantucket um, after I graduated, was not thinking about uh, a career, came back here and, and really struggled and to find my place. And, and, and so, and, and, and I had to kind of let go of this passion of purpose and find the passion of process and like this experience, but it took a while. And I remember at one point being really down and my dad turned to me and he said, you just got to get proactive, <laughs> which, which being proactive is I think actually a real theme and, and core uh, value of, of climate work um, and work in general. But I, so I just went out and found the place that fit in that moment, but it, you know, three and a half years in almost four years in when I was applying to business school, when the bubble was still building and hadn't yet burst, this idea of leaving, you know, a business development job in in a rapidly growing web advertising firm to go back to school seemed crazy when everyone in school was trying to get in. And I just felt like, boy, I, you know, I've I've had an incredible experience, but keeping the internet free is not the purpose and the mission that I want to devote my life to. So let me cash this experience in for a for an MBA if, if, so that I can develop the toolkit and the confidence and the network that I want to have to, to go out in the world and build this intersection I haven't found yet of sustainability and entrepreneurship and impact. And so if, it, if I can't find it, I, I, I guess I'll have to make it. And so that was kind of the, the transition back to business school. Yeah, the essay kind of writes itself. <laughs> that was it. Um, Actually, I was on I was on a run 
Um, and try to think about what the, the question is, what matters most to you and why, um, which anyone who's gone to the GSB has written that essay. Um, and, and I had just seen a headline in the Times about unsustainable harvesting practices leading to a global chocolate shortage. And I'm very addicted to my chocolate. And that was a very concerning headline. And that that's it. I'm going to write about chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> took, took a flyer there hoping someone in the admissions office might also be passionate about chocolate. <laughs> Well, and it requires extensive uh, market <laughs> testing, I think. Yes, for sure. Um, so did you have some sense of what that intersection looked like when you went back to business school? Or, or was the plan sort of like, hey, I've got two years and a bunch of smart people to like brainstorm for what that'll be? The latter. Um, very much so the latter. And it's interesting because I now meet students, you know, in my role as a, as a teacher and advisor, who know exactly what they're doing. They come in, they know exactly what venture they're trying to build or what sector they're trying to build. That was not me. Um, and it was also a very different time. There wasn't, climate tech wasn't a thing. Clean tech wasn't a thing. Even energy tech, you know, there wasn't, it just wasn't a thing yet. People sort of knew what climate change was, but it was way, you know, it was in the turn, you know, turn of the next century. People weren't really seriously putting attention to it, let alone building ventures around it. So it was- hey, a, This was late nineties? This was, I was GSB 02. So this was, I matriculated in 2000. Okay, so this oh, is yeah. still like people are figuring out uh, PERPA. And this is 1.0. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this okay. is web 1.0 and people are figuring, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 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 Very cool. Okay. So what was, yeah, walk us through that process then. You're like, uh, let me go to an MBA and figure out how I can like match this business skill set with your passion. How did yeah. that go? That was it. Well, I mean, it was great. The GSB is a pretty lovely place to be. I mean, I felt, well, if it was like sports camp, but with really smart people. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, so I definitely got that uh, itch scratched. And then, you know, I, I just met incredible people. I expanded my horizons in every direction, really so much more even than, than as an undergrad. Um, and, you know, I was the president of the environmental management club, the co-president with the other member of the environmental management club. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't also wasn't the thing on campus. You know, now the GSB energy club is the biggest, if not the second biggest club on, on in the community. Um, and I, I loved it. I made incredible lifelong friends. I learned a ton. I lived experiences I never imagined, but I didn't come out like, okay, and now I know exactly what I'm doing. And so I had the great fortune of uh, becoming a case writer for the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, hmm. which is um, just a gift of, of an experiential ed MBA um, on, on top of the you know curricular one. And uh, I got to work- second. Can you give us the 30 second of what that is and like how that applied? Yeah, well, how it applied is a fair question, but but um, but what it is, so you know, the Stanford Business School is obviously synonymous with entrepreneurship, and 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 there's a lot of juice that that keeps that engine flowing, and and that includes these incredible lecturers uh, who teach entrepreneurship, um, and so they all to teach entrepreneurship, they need cases to bring into the classroom, and so every year one or two students is selected to be a case writer. And to work with these lecturers uh, and their networks to develop cases to use in the classroom. So I got to work with the, the legends of, of, um, of entrepreneurship at the GSB, or Grosbeck, Chuck Holloway, Joel Peterson, Mark Leslie, um, Jim Ellis. So the, this was just, a, that was incredible. Um, and then I got to meet, you know, the management teams of these incredible companies and learn from their experiences. And then I got to write, which was also, it's a real, it's a very important and underrated skill. Um, and I wouldn't say I was a writer necessarily, but among MBAs, I was a writer. And so that sort of enabled me to, to fine tune that skill. Uh, and so, and then through this journey, I was thinking about, you know, my next steps, of course. And at that point still, it wasn't, it was still murky. And, and to the extent I was, finding places I was looking actually more into med tech and biotech as a way to kind of keep this entrepreneurship theme and impact, but the, the energy climate clean stuff still wasn't there yet. So I stayed on for two years actually as a case writer and then um, rejoined the management team I had been working with at Flycast, the web advertising firm at wine.com for a year, which was fun and <laughs> nothing wrong with that but still like mm, not what I'm I wanted sensing a theme though chocolate wine yeah like, exactly oh, I mean you know <laughs> you know you got to live your life at the same time um and then I saw this 
job. I actually had coffee with, um, with this, with Rob Day, who to this day is, is been a great connector and friend in the, in the clean tech space, who's now a founder of Spring Lane Capital. And he connected me with this, uh, this outfit TerraPass that had started as a class project at Wharton. Um, it was one of the first uh, uh, players in the voluntary carbon markets in the U.S. Mm. And it was at that point, like two students from the class that were going to keep the keep the venture going after the class project. And one of them was moving back to the Bay Area to be with his girlfriend, who in, in, in the small world that it is, his girlfriend turned out to be a friend of mine from growing up. I was actually we were in the. Um, Al- the, the Palo Alto Children's Theater, Alice in Wonderland production, um, where I was her understudy. She was the Dormouse, and I was I was the Three of Clubs, but also, <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote this cover letter, as you can imagine, rather colorful color letter connecting those dots, and became the first employee at TerraPass, which was the finally that intersection that I had been looking for since I graduated from Duke. And what, uh, yeah, what a path! Can you, what what year then was this? I mean, uh, like optional was- carbon accounting. Yeah, fall of two thousand and four. Okay. So I probably st- yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, we're, like who were like, how much did you have to sell companies on this idea? Like who like? Oh, you know, was, I mean, this was web advertising all over again, right? Like in the mid nineties, you're going to agencies and firms trying to explain to them what advertising, web advertising is, and why they would want it. And this was the same story of like, what is a carbon offset, and why do you want it? Um, I will say at the time there was, you know, there was a core dedicated group of committed people. And in the first, the, the, the original model was, was B2C. So it was selling direct to consumer, you know, we, we sold bumper stickers and you'd see tear passes on cars everywhere, um, which was pretty fun actually for a small company, you know, working out of like Tom's kitchen and then my living room and like, Oh, look, look at all these tear passes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but then what I did was build out, I was business development. So I built out the kind of B2B partnerships. So building out, you know, partnerships with Ford Motor Company to have a tear pass come with their, you know, with some of their vehicles. We worked with Sam's Club to, you know, have a carbon balanced, you know, leaf blower, like things like that. Um, uh, Enterprise rent a car. When you'd rent your car from Enterprise, it would, you would have the option to check the box. So, you know, now this stuff is everywhere. In 2004, 2005, no one had conceived of, of, of these ideas. Um, so built out the channel partnerships and the B2B piece of that. And at the time, you know, you have to remember the 2004, 2005 offsets, just re- um, avoiding emissions and balancing out your emissions was a was progress at that time. I, w- we are past that time and we can come back to it. You know, now we need, we're talking removals. And we were working with the Chicago Climate Exchange and doing bilateral transactions to retire credits on the Chicago Climate Exchange. We were probably one of the first targets of a Ben Elgin carbon offset hit piece, who now, you know, he's a reporter now at Bloomberg, was this uh, Newsweek or Business Week? Business Newsweek? I can't remember at the time. But it was, a, I remember the day when, when that story came out was one of the most disheartening and disorienting moments in my career where he just, tore us apart um, and, and, and ripped apart the, the idea of offsets and some of our, and one of our projects in particular, which was um, upsetting and, um, and, you know, quibbling with the details, but it, but it was really catalytic and that it launched TerraPass into an origination business where we went in and, and started and build out teams to originate these projects. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I still stand by the quality of the TerraPass of that time. It was then sold uh, to another company and brand is, is not what it was before. But, um, but that was, yeah, a journey, a lot of, that started my journey into the intersection of entrepreneurship, sustainability impact, into carbon markets, which I still think a lot about today, and into sort of market-based solutions to climate. Yeah, wild. Okay, can I, I don't want to dredge up too many rough memories, but <laughs> But I, I think it's a it's a uh, helpful. I think it's helpful to kind of explore. Like people are super catty about all of this stuff, right? And um, and I imagine from how you described it, he was like, "No, this is good. Like this idea is good, but execution is right." He was he was arguing that the execution of the offsets weren't actually accomplishing what you sort of said they were, right? Um, 
as that, opposed to and, arguing that like climate change wasn't real like right he was right. not arguing that climate change wasn't real but i think he was arguing offsets are you know are are just paying for your sins and you know the the, the act of them is is bad and the and the actions that 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 are being taken on their behalf are bad yeah. so it was it was both and how yeah and so you, you're like gosh you're living this every day but you're like huh well i mean that's a good point, but it practical or like, Hey, we have to start somewhere. Like, like walk through, you'd sort of finally found this perfect intersection, right? <laughs> of your, right? And I know, it, I know in reality, it's not really We're like playing this. my tiny little fiddle. <laughs> yeah. Like, like violin, but yeah, yeah, you're, you're literally creating a new market that people don't even yeah. know they want or need yet. And then you've yeah. got someone that's supposed to be on your side coming out and like, you know, probably making some good arguments and some BS arguments and like, how, yeah. yeah, walk through how you sort of dealt with that and how the team, I mean, it, it's uh, easy to yeah. be like, oh, well, we just pivoted, but it never, it's never like that, right? Like it's, it's painful. Yeah. You have to process it's it. Painful. Like how, yeah. how did you, how did you do that? Uh, pain and process. I mean, you're right. And actually back to Palo Alto being the cradle of like all things, Ben Elgin also went to my rival high school. He also went to Cali. Um, <laughs> Well, so a lot of introspection, a lot of investigation to understand like what what was being called into question and was that appropriate? And regardless, how do we protect ourselves from this going forward? And and the postmortem, I think, was our view was actually what we were doing was appropriate, but but understandably open to scrutiny and concern going forward. And so we needed to we decided to take that opportunity to become industry leaders in quality of offset projects origination and verification. And so I think it was, you know, after the initial just gut wrenching, like soul searching, oh my God, an embarrassment. I mean, thinking about, you know, here I'm out like the sales BD person talking to my all my network, and then this story comes out and they're, you know, you don't have a chance to to get offer your rebuttal to it at the scale of, of, sure. of a, this was, you know, print magazine days. Um, and so embarrassed, you know, what my friends and colleagues were thinking of me. Um, and so there was the regrouping, the rebuilding, which I think was, like I said, catalytic and, and very useful. And what continued was ongoing frustration between, you know, in the offset market, you're only as good as your worst competitor because the, the players that are doing the junk, projects and the junk offsets, that's then defines the market. Um, and this was also another um, eye-opening experience in that I learned that nonprofits aren't necessarily better or good. They just have a different tax structure. So there were nonprofits in the space doing the worst stuff yeah. and, and having to explain that we were a for-profit business in this, in this area that was called into question for its integrity. And we were for profit, so we must be the, you know, and trying to artfully and delicately walk people through, you know, the 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 forest of the maze of quality, um, while navigating the you know the, the tax structures and assumptions people have about those was was challenging, but also a great exercise. I mean, all of it helped fortify me for what I'm doing now. But but you know, drawing a few of those lessons, I I think this idea of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in climate work is really central because we need all hands on deck, all shots on goal. They're not all going to be perfect. They're going to be missed up. What's challenging and increasingly so as we get closer to the like timer going off is the rigor. You know, we, we also need rigor. We can't just don't let the perfect be the enemy. Good. Let's do all this. We, we need to keep ratcheting down. We need the Kaizen, you know, continual improvement. And so that's the tension. And you've got very well-intended people doing, you know, what they doing what they think is best or good or right, and you don't want to crush people's souls and enthusiasm, as you know. And I have that experience, but you also want to, you know, we all need to keep ratcheting to refining towards um, impact and efficacy and efficiency and um, getting CO two out of the atmosphere. <laughs> so, like, um, so that's. That's a tension that, that that people in this space obviously need to continue continue to navigate. Yeah, and one and a conversation that you continue to be a very active participant in. So I I want to dig into that for sure. But let's finish the last maybe decade and change and how you went from this uh, you know frontier of carbon markets to now 
a professor and, and um, everything else that you're doing, advisor and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were some, there were some babies in there, um, which sort of, which changed, you know, I had two startups at home and didn't want to, you know, be managing a startup professionally. So shifted gears to doing independent consulting um, for a while where I worked with family offices and foundations um, and NGOs around climate and energy strategy, just packaging my experience and skill sets into, into different partnerships and engagements. And that was what that chapter really taught me was, was the, um, was the challenge of strategic philanthropy and climate, um, and got a real uh, front row seat around, um, the opportunity set and the, and the, um, tools and, and tactics of philanthropy as it related to, to climate and, and identified areas could see quickly areas that really needed improvement there. And that is what started me on, um, my relationship and, 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 um, my, my number one earned me my number one fan post for Prime Coalition, which is a nonprofit based in Boston. And I, ran, I met Sarah a few years into that journey and, and have been a long time champion of their work and board member now. And Prime connects philanthropic and catalytic capital with uh, climate solutions um, in really efficacious and high impact ways. So that that sort of started that thread. Um, it also gave me a front row seat at seeing the disconnect between um, uh, foundation endowments and foundation grant making. And this was kind of, you know, around the beginning of the divestment movement, but 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 seeing kind of how disconnected um, the two sides of foundations can be in, in working cross purposes uh, with their endowment portfolios invested in destruction and their grant making portfolios invested in trying to put band-aids on that destruction and, and thinking about how to work more holistically and systemically through those uh, challenges. And then I had seen- Just yeah. quickly on that, that disconnect is mission mission alignment disconnect between two parts of the house that effectively have yeah. separate management teams. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there's a lot we could talk about there, but, 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 the, but that, but that, this little, this climate strategy partners chapter was, was, was um, stirring up these kind of thoughts and questions and opportunities. And then I they must have been seeking. I mean, someone was seeking you out to solve this or, or were you saying, hey, were you, were you walking in the door and saying, hey, guys, like this doesn't make sense? Well, well so this has sort of been part of my journey, too. I mean, people were seeking me out to solve other things and then I could spot these problems. So I helped launch Advanced Energy Economy, which is what with with Tom Steyer and his team at that time. And so that's sort of what got me into the Steyer orbital, which led ultimately to the Steyer Taylor Center at Stanford. But I went into philanthropy, worked with um, the Schmidt Family Foundation, the 11th hour project. Uh, and I, and, and got, that was the perch from which I developed my um, perspectives on strategic philanthropy and on alignment with endowment and um, and grant making, not necessarily. I don't mean that as a critique of Eleventh Hour or Schmidt. I mean that just like you're in the world and you see things you don't see otherwise. So that was. So I came in to do you know grant making or to do you know to develop businesses or or whatever it was. But but I developed perspectives that I wasn't being paid for <laughs> through that journey, um, and I carried that with me into my next chapter in terms of the types of solutions and types of opportunities I wanted to pursue because of what I learned in that, in that chapter. Uh, and then coming back to Stanford, you know, started as a consulting engagement, these, these centers and initiatives on campus get started, you know, with great conversations between benefactors and, and the development office. And then like, you know, the gift comes in, they stand up a thing, they name it. And then like making a there, there is another exercise and faculty are brilliant and great researchers and, sometimes great teachers, but they aren't business builders and connectors and entrepreneurs that are going to make their thing a thing. So I came into the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance, which is a joint initiative of the business school and the law school uh, around 2011 and 2012 full time um, to, to make it a thing. And, and I saw it as really a way to get back into my entrepreneurship uh, mode, but as an entrepreneur on campus, leveraging the assets of the university to develop and deploy climate solutions through the business school and the law school and the resources that were available to me there. 
Awesome. Yeah. It's like all of your, all of your experiences channeled. Yeah. In, like, literally all of your life experiences <laughs> yeah. channeled it, into one place. Yeah. It all makes sense in the review mirror. I will say that to, to, to students I advise too. Like it doesn't, I couldn't have, I didn't chart it, but looking back it, it all makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what is your, what did your dad say? Be proactive. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, be <laughs> yeah I, I, I mean, it is, it is a valuable lesson. Like it is worth us pausing and saying it out loud that like no one can really predict where their life ends up. And so you have to sort of make decisions in the moment with the information that you have and then yeah. like, make it what you can. So um, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like a lot of people like come in the climate, come into energy and they're, like they don't appreciate the scale and enormity of what we're talking about. And, you know, the two major problems are like energy access and energy impact. And it's like, yeah, yeah, like learn a bit about it and then nibble on, like, let's make marginal improvement, like, you know, get it rolling downhill. And so I don't know, it's, it's just a great, I guess, an observation from a number of conversations. Uh, but anyway, more about you building this thing and making it a thing. Um, yeah, what was that? I mean, the last decade, what was that? What was that like? What were the biggest challenges? Like, what are you most proud of? Mm. Uh, I am most proud of the relationships I've built with the students over the years and the wind that I've been able to put in their sails and what they have gone on to do. And I and 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 the grace they have shown in, in dropping me, you know, notes or coming back to campus to say it was your class or the conversation I had with you that that launched this that feels, that is such a gift um, and makes me feel so leveraged. You know, climate is such an overwhelming problem to be working on and any one thing you're doing feels like it's not enough. But if I can launch, you know, dozens or a hundred of, you know, Stanford graduate students into this conversation as the next generation of leaders, that feels really good. Yeah. Um, the challenge is, you know, it's funny, working in academia is a weird place, particularly, you know, as an entrepreneur. Um, if you are not a tenured faculty, you are not a tenured faculty. Um, and that's, you know, sort of doesn't compute. Um, and so you have to figure out how to get what you need out of the experience and give what you can give, set ego aside um, and drive towards the impact you wanna have. And so that, you know, that's a continual process of navigation. Um, also, it's the, you know, it's a huge bureaucracy. It is not a meritocracy. Um, but you sort of, I've carved my paths and I've found my, my, the places that I can, can have real impact and, and thrive and, and teaching is something that has evolved uh, over the years. That's not might be my sixth year was not something I ever thought I would do. I'm not a lecturer. I'm a doer, you know, I, um, but I, I was on my soapbox for so long about the dearth of curriculum for particularly Stanford business school students, um, on climate risk and opportunity. And, and we needed to be training them. If, if, you know, the, the motto for the GSB is change lives, change organizations, change the world. And how can we do that? If, if our students aren't armed with the information they need and the, and the data and the tools and the frameworks to, to lead through a changing climate. So, um, so I ended up teaching and, and that, uh, that has been, you know, that that's really been the sweet spot of these relationships with these students, but it also helps me learn and stay current. And as you said, you know, just a minute ago, when people come to work in climate, it's a big complex system with lots of moving parts and lots of complexity in, in, in time, in geography, um, in, in political economy and in, in multiple, you know, cross sectors. So, the, the class, the seminal class that I teach is, is a journey through climate, you know, past, present, and future on the pillars of politics, finance, and infrastructure, infrastructure being both the physical um, infrastructure, but also the institutions through which, you know, climate plays out. It's like, uh, it's seven different dissertations all in one. Yeah, it is, it is, and it's a two-unit class once a week for two hours, and each session could be an entire class, so it's definitely a fire hose. And, and the wonderful thing, and I'm so fortunate to be able to teach Stanford graduate students is they can handle that. You know, you, you just fire away and they will take what they want from it and run with it. And, you know, it's not, I'm not really teaching, I'm steering, you know, I'm, I'm sort of guiding you know, river guide for them, but, the, but they're, 
they're all smarter than I am. So they, <laughs> they can pick up what they need and run with it. Yeah. Uh, they maybe have different perspectives or different, <laughs> different learnings. I don't know about yeah. smarter. I, I do want to maybe explore the thought that you had a little bit earlier, right? Which is like, okay, you see this um, breadth of perspective you're you're on the front lines of conversations with students with faculty with with entrepreneurs like how do we find the right balance between kind of narrowing in on what we need to do versus leaving the top of the funnel as broad as we can yeah. for future solutions well i've been waiting this long to get into carbon accounting <laughs> which is where people are like oh got to go time to go to sleep oh let's um, get into it but let's get into it because it it embodies this tension because we have been operating um, in a voluntary arena on climate action for so long because we can't, we, the global climate community can't get our acts together for very understandable and like very long standing diagnosed reasons why, you know, the, the UNFCCC process has not resulted in the like global price on carbon for the last 30 years. So not making perfect the enemy good, well intended passionate, committed climate champions have been trying to move mountains to get what we can get done in a voluntary regime. And that has evolved into this practice of net zero and climate disclosure. And I've been pushing with, with you know, the, the, the broader community around these topics for decades now to try and get companies and investors to measure the, the climate impacts of in their portfolios, disclose that and to drive towards decarbonization out of um, both, the, you know, mitigating risk and capitalizing on opportunities. That is all very sound and, and, and logical and, and critical, it, particularly in the absence of, of policy. And now we're seeing, you know, patchworks of policy all subscale, although the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, pulled me out of depression this summer and is a big, huge win. But as we all know, you know, it's not enough. Um, and so what we have now is, is a system of pledges and um, voluntary pledges and um, data that is and tools that aren't fit for purpose in achieving those voluntary pledges and uh the challenge as we ratchet and, and try and implement of um, a lack of managerial obligations to actually spend real money to achieve these targets, which are going to require reallocation of capital. And, and at the core, at the foundation of all of this work is the greenhouse gas protocol, which was a brilliant and necessary tool developed several a couple decades ago as a proxy for risk management to understand you know in 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 anticipation of a global carbon price you know where is you, what's that going to do to a firm um, it was never meant as an accounting system it was never meant to compare companies and yet it is the tool that we've been using to measure a company's carbon for, you know we were using this at TerraPass, um, you know doing our carbon footprinting for businesses and, and households um, and so the, the, this is gets back into the, where the perfect meets, you know, uh, where we need a little more perfection and the, and the good is not good enough because as we drive towards implementation of net zero pledges, we're doing it on, on, on kind of a house of cards or a sandcastle of data because the, the, the protocol um, is not in it. We need to move from counting carbon to accounting for carbon. And so the protocol is counting carbon um, by adding up scopes one, two, and three, but that is detached from actual emissions in the atmosphere. And it's, so remember our scope, scope one are actual emissions in the atmosphere. Scopes two and three are reassigning someone else's scope one emissions to another for the purposes of you know, anticipating implications of carbon pricing or for the purposes of advocacy, which is important but different than an accounting system. And so what we need is a system of accounting for carbon where you understand a product or services carbon impact from cradle to gate, because that's where it is auditable and measurable. And so each time a, a, a product changes hands in a supply chain, it is it, it, the emissions associated with that, the scope one emissions associated with that product are accounted for. So that by the time you have you know, I have my iPhone from Apple. I've got, I know the Eli, I know the emissions and we'll call emissions liabilities um, with, associated with this phone. 
that then cre creates a, a, a system on which you can manage your account. So if this is, if, if, and then this ties back into how to fulfill net zero pledges, whether this liability then transfers to me when I purchase it, or whether Apple in its pledge to be a net zero company retains that the emissions on their balance sheet. Um, but by but by tracking emissions through a supply chain, you have a measurable, monitorable, monitorable, auditable carbon value associated with every product and service that then mandates uh, what we've called emissions uh, an emissions liability management function, where you have to balance those emissions that are associated with with this these products and services to to an actual number, and that then builds a foundation for carbon market development for increasing the cost of capital on high emitting firms, for aligning corporate, national and global carbon ledgers. You have the actual counts of, uh, you have the actual ledgers for carbon accounting. And so this is back to the sort of perfect being the enemy of the good. This is, this is a pain point, right? This is back to that Newsweek article in 2005 or six, where it's like, oh my God, I've, all these people who are using the GHG protocol to, to, um, to mark the start of their net zero pledges and are trying to drive down their numbers to these normative targets, those numbers aren't real. Those numbers are double, triple, multiple countings of, of emissions, which if it were double counting, that'd be fine. We'd cut it in half and you'd be done. But, but it's not, it's an indeterminate count of emissions. So you don't actually know what emissions are embedded in your products or services and therefore you're responsible for which makes it very hard to, to manage them down. And so we are at this moment where we need to re reset um, to a level better than good because we've got a time test here and, and, the, and the activities that we're doing right now aren't going to get us where we need to go. We need an actual carbon accounting. And that's a really tough spot for people who have invested so much in the development of, in the application of the protocol, who have invested so much in this, in this global architecture around net zero and G, you know, the G fans and net zero pledges and all this stuff is built on this system that as people go to implement it, they're finding it's not, it's not enough. It's not working to get them where they need to go. And in particular, it's lacking the management obligations to, in, to make material investments in decarbonization of supply chains and of, um, of which and and of these technologies and industries that that aren't currently you know in the money, and so that the, the what what real carbon accounting would do would be to create the managerial obligations by balancing your balance sheet that would then enable companies to make real investments in in decarbonizing in decarbonizing their supply chains, and that kind of that 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 the missing pieces of managerial obligations and clear boundaries, which is what I was getting into with the, with the, with moving from counting scopes to actually counting carbon is what are the ratchets we need to make this, this um, suite of activities around net zero targets and pledges actually land. Hmm. And, and that's a real tough one in making, you know, in this sort of, well, we don't want to make the perfect enemy the good. We, 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 <laughs> we, if we know something isn't working, we we don't have time to waste. But how does perfection in this system, right? I mean, isn't this, uh, uh, what did you say earlier? Just pay for your sins? Um, yeah. Right? I mean, it's a little bit like, like a, a balance sheet accounting liability without the opportunity to actually retire it with a true... I mean, are you are you saying you retire that with an offset or you retire it with some sort of direct capture, right? I mean, because the only way to truly counter that liability is to suck it back out of the air and without a real energy efficient source for that, right? Or maybe that's the implication is that no. the price moves to your marginal price of sucking carbon out of the air, which... So you got it. You went right to where to tying this whole conversation back together, back to the, the offset market and how balance sheets actually create the market integrity that is missing in the current state of voluntary offsets, mm. because these liabilities are essentially permanent. You, if CO2 in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, methane, you know, 
less than that, you can do, you know, you can, you can make these calculations according to the, to the shelf life, the greenhouse gases, but, but these are, these are much longer term liabilities than, than the current practice of net zero is accounting for, right. Which is accounting for them as a flow. It's like, Oh, I had these emissions this year. I buy these offsets this year, tear them up. I'm good. Wait a minute. <laughs> Actually, those emissions from this year are there for 500 right. years. <laughs> and the thing you tore up might also burn up next year. And then not only did you not balance your emissions from that year, but you also created new scope one emissions that no one is accounted for. And so the, the, the balance sheet, the elegance of the balance sheet is it creates the structure and the framework to manage these long term liabilities. And then your, your, then your question is, well, how would you, so, so you're right. The only way you permanently retire a liability today would be to, you know, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it in a rock for a thousand years. That's many hundred dollars, you know, $700 a ton, whatever the latest pricing is that's expensive. Um, but you don't, but, but so that creates kind of the reference asset price. And then you can, you can markets will develop their forward curves around how to drive that price down through investment in those technologies. In the meantime, what we really need coming back to offsets and, and nature is the preservation of our natural carbon sinks, which we're struggling to develop the investment mechanisms to protect. If those are then priced according, you can, you can, it creates the opportunity for investment in those assets and to hold them appropriately. So you've got a, a, a natural sink. There are now there are questions, of course, around ownership of those assets. This is where the alignment of ledgers come up, right? Like if those assets are actually owned by, you know, the Indonesian government and they're part of their preservation is actually part of Indonesia's nationally determined commitment. Like, how, so really those shouldn't be for sale. So you get into questions of what's actually for sale and who owns it, which again, brings integrity to the carbon markets that's missing. But let's say here, you know, in the US, you've got some forest in the Northwest that um, that meets additionality criteria, meets, um, you know, the, the legal, legal hurdles, which we need to develop and structures to develop to understand what's a saleable asset. But that then becomes, you know, the the asset that's matched against the liability, but it is matched, you know, annually. And if it burns, it's a new scope one emissions and you've got to account for that and you've got to re find something else to balance. But it becomes a and so the, the question of quality on nature based solutions isn't it, it's it's OK if they're not permanent, they can be priced according to their duration, but they need to be. But the balance sheet needs to balance every year. And so you create the opportunity to invest in what we know we need to invest in, in terms of nature and natural carbon sinks, but we do it in a way that has integrity on the permanence issue and, and manages that through a carbon balance sheet. Interesting. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm going to ask a pokey <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, okay. Is that the lowest hanging fruit as we sit here right now? Like, like I, I, I hear you. I love nothing more than market-based solutions. I'm from the Midwest. I've got the streak of libertarian. I love it. Your base. I mean, I think in order for that system to work, it needs an enormous amount of resources broadly defined around like policy change gap in IFRS changes, like tracking and recording, like, is that, is that in the next three years, is that where the biggest momentum comes so very good question and as we know in all things climate we have to walk and chew gum right like with this comes back to the all hands on deck all shit. like we have to do and it all. always trade off yeah. and, there's and there's always trade off so here's so my like prescription higher frequency scope two emissions we got to get scope two right like right now annual emissions for scope two doesn't make any sense and totally destroys incentives around like decarbonization of grids. So we can we can get better on our scope two accounting to drive more decarbonization of the electric power sector, which we all know we need to then electrify everything and have it be clean. So like, yeah, start there and that's happening now and we can do that wisely. And at the same time, we have to start to come to accept that this system of counting scopes isn't going to cut the mustard. And so we need to start to steer the tanker in the direction of e-liabilities and carbon balance sheets. How do you do that? Well, you do that. We're already, e-liabilities is just upstream scope three. We just need to do it better. And companies are already asking their suppliers far flung places of the world to report their emissions, which God help us all how that like <laughs> is going to get done. But the, 
But it needs to, if we're going to do this, it needs to get done. The difference is with a system of e-liabilities, when you get the data right, and the hardest part is stuff changing in the in the ground, right? Like what are the sensors and what are the what's the monitoring and how do we actually know the carbon flux in these like things changes to our natural system? That's gonna be hard. Electricity is easy, we know that. Like, but those things are so you all the way up the supply chain, there's hard stuff, but once you we need that innovation, we need that technology, but once you get that in a system of e liabilities, it'll matter because you'll have the data to then carry through the chain very clearly. In our current system, there's no incentive for solving that because you can use estimates and it does, and the data is all mushy anyway. So who really knows? So, so it's going to take time, but we're the thing we're already doing a lot of the activities that would line up with this system. We just need to get a clearer on where we're heading. So, we're, while asking for this data from the supply chain, account for it like you would cost accounting or your value added tax and do this kind of e-liability system instead of adding up your scopes. And then by the time you, so then we can solve this cradle to great, excuse me, cradle to gate piece. So that's fine tuning what's already being done. Then we need to kind of let go. It's the gate to grave part that really upsets people in this idea of transitioning to an e-liability system, because it's like, wait a minute, oil and gas companies, car companies, like all that, you know, 90 plus percent of emissions are scope three, right? Well, of course they're, because they're, well, first of all, they're counted there. It's an infinite number, but it's, that's us. That's the car you drive, the flight you get on, the light you just turned on. And so what, what we ought, what we need to come to this point of recognition that, that the downstream stuff, mar the markets are not going to solve the downstream piece. We need policy to solve the downstream piece. And you're seeing, the exciting thing is you're seeing it, you're seeing it with, EV mandates, targets, efficiency standards, you know, carbon border adjustments, like that's that's all, the wheels are turning there. Um, and then you're still gonna have leading companies that are gonna say, I, I care about my, I care about my cradle to grave emissions and I'm gonna just voluntarily make zero emissions product, great. But, and, and, and then for, you know, we also can see how this breaks down with automotive companies. You know, if you try and force, companies to manage scopes outside their boundaries where they're having to estimate data and they have no control over it, you get a ton of gaming. So automotive companies in the, in the, in the EU who are now having to report their scope three, they're saying, oh, my, you know, my car that used to run for a hundred thousand miles, that's your warranty. It's now 10 because I'm going to replace the spark plug. I'm going to give, put, put spark plugs in that, that are no good after 10,000 miles. And once you replace the spark plugs, it's not the warranty is dead. So I just reduced my scope three emissions by 90%. Go me. Like that stuff is just, it's nonsense. And that's where we're heading. And to your point about how do we, you know, IFRS, ISSB. Yeah. But look what's happened in the last two years. I mean, no one was even using the word net zero four years ago. Now you've got, you know, 80% of corporate America, $150 trillion in GFANs all aligned around it. You've got the you've got this new International Sustainability Standards Board. You've got IFR, like people are talking about this stuff at levels and with seriousness. No one was talking about it even a couple of years ago. So all, we're just fine tuning. Either people are serious and they want better tools to get it done, or they're not serious and they know that what we have now is a game. And we'll say well, whatever we can say to look good, and we know it's not. It's going to be of no consequence. But if I don't want to live in that world. I want to live in the world where we're serious about this and we know we're going to have to reallocate capital. And this system would give us the tools to actually do that with clear boundaries and real managerial obligations and dealing with these issues of timing. Amazing. Well, I'm glad you're on the front lines getting it all figured <laughs> out. Well, I'm, 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 recru I'm the chief recru recruiter for the climate army because it's not... <laughs> No, it's great. I, it's not, I mean, the truth is some are one and, yeah. and some are the others and the people that are serious yeah. need that right path. So yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And that gets back to the Terrapath story. Like we were serious. And so, you know, you, it hurts to feel like you might've done something wrong or you're on the wrong path and you got to just like regroup, dig deep and, and build the path. That's the right one. Um, we yeah. can't, we have to have humility and, and have to get proactive. <laughs> Amazing. On that note, um, uh, really great talking with you. Can't wait to see you be proactive uh, here <laughs> in the next decade. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Pleasure talking with you. Our leadership in science and industry 
our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.